Welcome, I'm Katherine Hadro, and this is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Defending Hyde. Pro-Life lawmakers continue their push for bipartisan support of the Hyde Amendment, preventing tax dollars from going towards abortions. We speak with Pro-Life Caucus co-chair Representative Chris Smith of New Jersey to hear how his new bill would make Hyde permanent law. Shocking allegations, pop singer Britney Spears claims she's been forced to wear an IUD against her will as she asks the judge to end her court conservatorship. With the story continuing to make headlines, I speak out against forced contraception. At Applog, we exist to empower women with information. We believe that our female patients are intelligent. We believe they're capable of making informed choices. But in, in order to make an informed choice, they need the information. Delivering life and truth. We introduce you to Dr. Christina Francis, who heads a group of pro-life obstetricians and gynecologists. Why their mission is more important than ever, so they can care for both their patients, mother and child. The House Pro-Life Caucus and Republican leadership are calling for House Democrats to consider a bill that would make the Hyde Amendment permanent. It is a national shame for this administration and congressional Democrats to overlook and marginalize the right to life that we as Americans hold dear. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is not just a saying. It is a guiding principle by which we should all govern. That's House Congressional Pro-Life Caucus co-chair Representative Kat Kamick of Florida calling on House Democrats to consider a bill known as the No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion and Abortion Insurance Full Disclosure Act of 2021. If passed, it would forbid taxpayer dollars from funding abortions and would make the Hyde Amendment permanent law. This is a pro-life priority right now because the House is considering President Joe Biden's budget proposal, which repealed the Hyde Amendment. The bill was introduced by Representative Chris Smith of New Jersey. Pro-life representatives plan to keep asking for the bill to get unanimous consent, so it's brought to the House floor for a vote. Joining us now from Capitol Hill is Representative Chris Smith of New Jersey. He's co-chair of the House Congressional Pro-Life Caucus. Congressman, welcome back. You have been serving in the U.S. House since 1981. First off, for some context, has the Hyde Amendment enjoyed bipartisan support for most of your career. Uh, great point, it has. As a matter of fact, uh, when Jim Oberstar from Minnesota was pro-life caucus co-chair with me, uh, you know, he and, and a large number of Democrats, as many as 80, going back to the early 1980s, were in favor of the Hyde Amendment. Now, we may have zero Democrats. They have been unfortunately defeated in primaries, like Dan Lipinski and, and others. Uh, so they're, you know, it's all one party. We are the party of life. And I say with great sadness and sorrow, the Democratic Party and has become the party of death. And that includes the abortion president, uh, Joe Biden. Mm. You, along with the other co-chairs of the House <clears throat> Pro-Life Caucus, are calling on House Democrats to consider your bill, as I mentioned, the No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion and Abortion Insurance Full Disclosure Act of 2021. Congressman, can you give us a brief summary of your bill and your 18 sure. days for H.R. 18 initiative? Sure, sure. Um, the, the bill is a government-wide uh, effort to preclude funding, to prevent funding, taxpayer-subsidized abortion on demand. Uh, the Hyde Amendment, my amendment to the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program that I offered first back in 1983, which is current law, the Dornan Amendment for the D.C. Appropriations, which is current law, and all the other what we call riders, legislation attached to or riding on top of uh, the appropriations bills that have to be annually renewed. Uh, and that's the, the fear we have right now. That's the concern we have right now, that Biden wants to get rid of every single one of them. The Appropriations Committee is already moving right now to get rid of every single pro-life policy. So taxpayers would be coerced, would be forced uh, to pay for abortion on demand uh, throughout the entire country. Um, some 2.4 million babies have been saved by the Hyde Amendment alone, about 60,000 a year. Why? Because there was no subsidy, no money 
uh, available, no public funding uh, to, to enable uh, the killing of that unborn child. And the law is a great teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when, when there is a stricture that says, we don't want anything to do with it. It does cause second thinking and hopefully reevaluations that hmm, why is the government not paying for this? Because it's the killing either by dismemberment abortion or by chemical poisoning uh, a defenseless unborn child. And what we know now too, as you know, Catherine, uh, the injury to women, especially psychological, is profound. Um, you know, the, the, the silent no more awareness efforts and, and, and the, you know, women who speak out now so boldly and courageously having had abortions, warning others not to do it. Now, HR 18, we are doing unanimous cons consent requests uh, that if the presiding officer, the presiding speaker at the time says, okay, the bill comes up and we have a vote. We can't even get a vote on HR 18, the No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion Act. Uh, and we, we are trying very hard to at least have an up or down, have a debate, and have a vote. Well, thank you for your leadership on that. I want to get your thoughts on this, Congressman. 60 of your Democrat Catholic colleagues recently released a statement of principles with a message to U.S. bishops that withholding Holy Communion to pro-abortion lawmakers would be contradictory. As a Catholic yourself, what did you make of that statement, and are your Democrat Catholic colleagues the ones who are politicizing the Eucharist, in your opinion? It's a great question and uh, a great insight because as far as I'm concerned, when the bishops, when the priests, when the clergy uh, admonish members of Congress or any politician speaking truth to power to defend the least of our brethren, and who, who told us to defend the least of our brethren? It was Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 25 when he said, whatsoever you do to the least of these, you do likewise to me. So we need to see the face of Christ uh, in every vulnerable person, whether it be a trafficking victim uh, or a homeless person or an unborn child, uh, and say we need to put our arms around that person. And you know, the bishops are doing this, I believe, if they do do it, out of love uh, and out of compassion and out of, of a pastoral approach uh, that, you know, what are we told in the Bible? If somebody's doing something especially egregiously wrong, you go and you tell them. You try to encourage them to see the light. And, and the, you know, the rhetoric that cloaks abortion, uh, the, all of the right to choose, uh, all the euphemisms, when you get down to it, the methods of abortion, dismember a child, decapitate a child, uh, take off his or her arms and legs, um, it is a despicable method as well as the chemical uh, abortions uh, that, that, like RU46, what does it do? First, it starves a baby to death, one of the chemicals, and the second chemical just causes the child to be expulsed from the womb. Um, this is nothing benign or compassionate or nurturing mm -hmm. about the methods of abortion. And so I think the bishops, you know, they have forever dialogued with members of Congress, and it has come uh, where we have now a more extreme White House than we've ever had before, and that goes for Vice President Harris, uh, who goes to all of these conferences. She's speaking to a conference today or tomorrow that's in, in, um, in France, uh, which is promoting the aggressive abortion agenda, forcing it upon uh, the African countries, the Latin American countries that are still pro-life, and there are many, upon Poland and other countries where you have you know, a, a principled view by government leaders. Uh, so. Uh, I think they have every right to speak out and to do, you know, the call is the bishops, not mine, mm -hmm. uh, but, but, you know, this is such an egregious act uh, to take the life right. of an unborn child and again to injure the mom. Well, thank you for speaking out and for your leadership and taking the time to be with us today. Representative Chris Smith of New Jersey, thank you. Thank you so much. And joining us now in studio is Mallory Quigley, Vice President of Communications for the Susan B. Anthony List. Mallory, great to see you. As we were just discussing with the congressman, we're seeing a series of pro-life representatives call for Democrats to consider H.R. 18. Is this an effective strategy, considering the House is under a pro-abortion majority? Why is it important that pro-life members are doing this right yes, now? Yes, that's right. Well, it's an effective strategy to keep it top of mind for the constituents, for the press, and for the legislators themselves. Mm -hmm. Taxpayer funding of abortion is a very unpopular issue, no matter what side of the aisle you're on. So, like Congressman Smith was saying, if pro-abortion Democrats really want to force Americans to pay for abortion on demand, they ought to just support an up or down vote. So by keeping these 
unanimous consent requests going every day, multiple times a day. It's keeping the news alive and giving time for constituents to be educated so that they can call their members. Yeah, that's a really good point. And in addition to Hyde, President Biden's budget also repealed the Dornan Amendment. How significant is that? Dornan is, is very significant, but not only Dornan, the Smith Amendment, like you said, Helms, Kemp, Kasten, there's a series of these pro-life riders that have different names that have historically enjoyed bipartisan support. Dornan is special because it affects taxpayer funding of abortion here in the District of Columbia, you know, our nation's capital, and it has saved historically a thousand lives per year, a thousand children in our the heart of our nation's capital uh, being protected from abortion because of this Dornan Amendment. How likely do you think that ultimately the Hyde Amendment and other pro-life amendments will be included in I think, the final budget? I think it depends on how long the process is going to take. Okay. I mean, usually it's going to, there, it's weeks long. There's going to be a big um, committee markup the week after next. Um, we'll see what other news fills in. They're trying to do a lot of things on the Hill right now. So if we can increase awareness of this issue with taxpayer funding of abortion and the Hyde and Hyde adjacent mm -hmm. amendments, keep this in front of the eyes and the hearts and minds of American people, get them calling their members of Congress, there's a chance we could save Hyde. Okay, that's really good to know. Shifting gears a bit, Mallory, a new poll by APNORC finds that a majority of Americans do support limits on late-term abortions. According to the poll, 65% of Americans believe abortion should be illegal in the second trimester. 80% of Americans believe abortion should be illegal in the third trimester. Mallory, what does this reveal to us about American attitudes on abortion today? Yes, well, this reflects what we already know, Catherine, right? I mean, Americans are pro-life. They support compassionate, common-sense regulations on abortion. What's significant about this poll is that it has the weight of the Associated Press, the AP, behind it. And so that's going to get people to start paying attention until, uh, and hopefully, Democratic legislators, people who are pushing pro-abortion legislation, if they can start to feel that political pressure, maybe it will have an impact, hopefully, on their policy votes. Well, to that very point, knowing this, do you believe an extreme pro-abortion platform will ultimately hurt Democrats in the 2022 midterm election? Yes, it, it all comes down to how much of an issue we can make this in elections. How clearly can we draw the contrast between two candidates and their issue on uh, and their their positions on this very important issue that people feel strongly about? Um, and historically, the edge goes to the pro-life candidates. People are more pro-life. The polling continues to back that up. So it will be a political liability if we can continue to make it a big issue. That's, uh, that is really important right now. And Mallory, you know, we have about a minute left. As this budget battle is going on on Capitol Hill, what should our viewers know at home? Is there any way they can make a difference from home? Yes. So keep calling your legislative offices, if you, especially if you are represented by a pro-abortion Democrat. They need to feel the political heat so that they may see the light on this issue. And this is something that's really common sense. A majority, you know, a lot of the polling says that even pro-choice people who consider themselves mm -hmm. to be pro-choice don't want, still don't want their taxpayer dollars going to fund abortion, abortion on demand or abortion businesses here and overseas. Mm -hmm. So um, this is an issue where there's common ground. We've got to keep waking up legislators who are beholden to the abortion industry. So keep calling, keep praying. And if the process seems to drag on, that's most likely going to uh, work in our favor for the pro-life movement. That's some really good intel for our viewers to hear. Mallory Quigley, Vice President of Communications from the Susan B. Anthony List, thank you so much. Thanks, Catherine. Coming up, forced contraception is in the news as pop singer Britney Spears says she's been forced to wear an IUD. I speak out next. Patients want a pro-life OBGYN. They want to know when they come and they've got a pregnancy complication or maybe their baby receives an adverse diagnosis, they want to know that their physician isn't going to automatically jump to, well, you could terminate your pregnancy. Plus, a pro-life obstetrician says women want doctors who are pro-life. We'll tell you more about her mission next. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hedro. Pop singer Britney Spears claims she's been forced to wear an IUD against her will. That is this week's Speak Out segment.
Britney Spears last week asked a judge to end her court conservatorship that has controlled her life and money for the past 13 years. The pop singer says it's been abusive. She accused her conservators of forcing birth control on her along with other medications. Listen to this audio from her court testimony, which sent shockwaves across the world. I want to be able to get married and have a baby. I was told right now in the conservatorship I'm not able to get married or have a baby. I have a um, ID inside of myself right now so I don't get pregnant. I wanted to take the ID out so I could start trying to have another baby, but this so-called team won't let me go to the doctor to take it out because they, they don't want me to have children. The 39-year-old said she wishes to marry her boyfriend and build a family. No ruling has been made on her case, but a long legal process is expected. Some pro-life leaders reacted to the shocking allegations. Live Action President Lila Rose tweeted, in part, forcing someone to have an IUD stuck in their body is a severe human rights abuse. Meanwhile, abortion advocates are using the Spears case to defend their stance. Planned Parenthood President Alexis McGill Johnson had this to say on MSNBC. I want to be clear, what is happening to Britney Spears is actually a form of reproductive coercion. That's what I tweeted about. And I, and I think the, the bigger point is no one should be making decisions about your reproductive health except for you, except for us, right? What a deceitful web you weave, Planned Parenthood, to try and take the moral high horse on this one. But you need to take a seat. You are not the hero here. If what Britney Spears claims is true, her conservators are allegedly deeming her incapable of motherhood. That is exactly what Planned Parenthood does when they push abortion and contraception onto women who are in need of resources. Instead of being a helping hand and encouragement, the abortion industry feeds a lie to women. They are not strong enough to be a mother to their own child. Tell me, what is the difference between that and what Spears is alleging the conservators of doing with the forced IUD? And let's have a little history lesson on forced contraception, shall we? The birth control pill, for example, when being developed, was tested on women in a Massachusetts asylum and in poor neighborhoods in Puerto Rico. That's right, contraception was tested against the will of mental hospital patients. Britney Spears is reported to have mental health issues and now claims she is a victim of forced contraception. This is deeply disturbing. But for those of us who have been paying attention to the eugenic nature of contraception, it's unfortunately not surprising. Forced contraception is an egregious human rights abuse. Praise God for the Catholic Church's courage and being a consistent voice of truth on that and against contraception. Let us pray these headlines shine a spotlight on the dangerous history of contraception and pray that no one, whether they are famous or not, whether they have mental health issues or not, be forced against their will to have contraception. With so much pro-abortion pressure facing the medical community today, there's a great need for pro-life OBGYNs to stick together and be a voice for both of their patients, the mother and the child. Here's more on a group doing just that for this week's Pro-Life Focus. Dr. Christina Francis has traveled the world in her role as an obstetrician gynecologist. She served in Romania, Burma, Israel, and for three years worked as the only OBGYN at a mission hospital in rural Kenya. Now back at home in the United States, she has a different medical mission as chairman of the board for APLOG, or the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists. At APLOG, we exist to empower women with information. We believe that our female patients are intelligent. We believe they're capable of making informed choices. But in, in order to make an informed choice, they need the information. The need for APLOG developed during the sexual revolution as ACOG, or the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, began to aggressively push for abortion, even contributing language to the Roe versus Wade Supreme Court case. Pro-life OBs within the membership organization banded together to form the special interest group, APLOG. Many of the pro-life members, which really was the majority of ACOG's membership at the time, saw the move that was happening within ACOG and they started to form a pro-life group. And we quickly became the largest special interest group within ACOG. 
and remained so until ACOG conveniently disbanded all special interest groups in 2013. It's very important that APLOG exists in that realm as a professional medical organization because we are able to provide a second opinion of sorts. We're able to provide a dissenting medical opinion to the pro-abortion opinion of ACOG. Today, APLOG is the pro-science and medical voice of authority for the pro-life movement. Dr. Francis frequently debunks pro-abortion medical claims at pro-life events and in the media. And if these restrictions are lifted, especially if they're lifted permanently as the abortion industry would like for them to be, we are going to see women maimed, injured, and even dying um, potentially in the, in the thousands because of that. I really see us as being the medical backbone of the pro-life movement and the pro-life community. One way APLOG flexes their medical muscle in the pro-life movement is by advancing the truth about abortion pill reversals. That's when a mother who has taken the first of two abortion pills gets a large dose of progesterone to potentially save the life of their unborn child. An often successful procedure, the abortion industry frequently downplays. Why do you think then we hear so frequently from abortion advocates that abortion pill reversal, that is junk science? Well, you know, this is a lie and rhetoric that I really wish would go away. This is not junk science. It's proven by studies that were done when Mifeprex was in development. So even the manufacturer's own studies show that progesterone works to reverse the effects of Mifepristone. It's been shown in case series and it is consistent with the pharmacokinetics or how we know Mifeprex works. And so it's proven by basic laboratory science, it's proven by animal studies, and it's now proven in human beings as well. And um, so the people that are deciding to ignore that, actually talking about ACOG as well, in their practice bulletin on um, medication abortion, so these are practice guidelines that they're giving to OBGYNs uh, for medication abortion. They actually state in their practice bulletin that you shouldn't give the medication Depo-Provera, which is a, a birth control, a contraceptive shot that's a large dose of progesterone, that you shouldn't give it as, at the same time as a woman takes Mifeprex because, and I quote, it increases the risk of ongoing pregnancy. So ACOG in their own practice bulletin admits that progesterone works to decrease the effectiveness of Mifeprex, but yet they say that APR is unproven science. So they're talking out of both sides of their mouth. It seems to me that all OBGYNs who are, it's their goal to care for both the baby and the mother. It seems that all OBGYNs would be pro-life, but how common is that not the case in fact? Well, you know, you're right. One of the things that I love about my job as an OBGYN, that I love about my profession, is it's actually a challenge to take care of two patients at once, you know? And so you're right. It, it would seem completely antithetical to the practice of OBGYN to do abortions, to electively end the life of that preborn child. Dr. Francis says it's estimated about 7% of OBs in practice do abortions. A majority do not. I think that there's a reason for that. I think it's because many people in this profession know that that's a human being in utero that we're taking care of. That's one of our two patients. And it would be, like I said, antithetical to the practice of OBGYN to end the life of that patient. That being said, how do you think outwardly pro-life OBGYNs are viewed within the wider medical community? Well, so it's getting harder and harder for um, OBGYNs to be publicly pro-life and to, and to voice that opinion because of the pressure that's being placed on them by the larger medical societies like ACOG. At APLOG, we're especially concerned about the pressure that's being placed on medical students and OBGYN residents. An example of that concern, Dr. Francis tells us, is that an accrediting body has told all residency programs medical students must learn abortions as part of their training. If that conflicts with their values, the burden is on the student to opt out. If someone for you know religious or moral reasons doesn't want to do abortions, that they, as the little intern who you know has their whole future career ahead of them, they have to be bold enough to say to their attending physicians and to the people determining the course of their career, 
I don't want to do this. And patients want a pro-life OBGYN. They want to know when they come and they've got a pregnancy complication or maybe their baby receives an adverse diagnosis, they want to know that their physician isn't going to automatically jump to, well, you could terminate your pregnancy. They want to know that we're going to fight for them, that we're going to do everything possible that we can to benefit them and benefit their child. So patients definitely want pro-life physicians, but unfortunately the mainstream medical system is ignoring that. And they're ignoring what most OBGYNs, how most OBGYNs desire to practice, um, and they're making it more and more difficult for pro-life uh, medical students to go into the field of OBGYN, which is really unfortunate. Given the pro-abortion pressures facing the medical community, Dr. Francis encourages pro-life medical students to stay strong. What do you want to say to pro-life medical students right now? It's not an easy field to go into if you are pro-life. I mean, it's, it is fraught with some ethical considerations. However, what I would say to them then is you are not alone in this. In fact, this is a big part of what APLUG does. We exist to support uh, medical students and residents who are pro-life who are desiring to live out their pro-life values in their medical practice. And that's not just coming from a moral standpoint or a religious standpoint. You know, it's coming from doing what's best for their patients, too. The these students or residents when they're you know in their training program and maybe their their upper level residents or their attending physicians are saying well you have to provide abortion because abortion is health care and abortion is what's good for women they don't just have to say you know what I have a religious objection to abortion they can say actually that's not what's best for my patient and here's why because it causes an increased risk of preterm birth it causes an increased risk of breast cancer it causes an increased risk of mental health disorders and so why would I recommend some Something like that to my patient. I think all of us, regardless of your stance on abortion, all of us should agree that we should be protecting women's health, not doing things that damage it. It's clear that Dr. Francis and other APLOG members, in between delivering babies, are also delivering the much needed truth today. To learn more about APLOG and to find pro life OBs near you, go to AAPLOG. Org. That does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Until next time, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. You can also send us a message by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. We love to hear from you. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.